Happy Halloween and welcome to episode 99 of The Energy Detox, where you and I, Joe Sinnott, will dive into three distinct types of fear that you face as a leader in the energy industry. And to drive today's conversation, we're going to lean on three timely topics that all are connected in some way to fear. One of those, of course, is Halloween, a holiday that is driven in many ways by fear. The second of those is the election. Again, something that demonstrates how people use fear to motivate others, in this case, to vote for or against certain candidates. And the third item that we're going to lean on is the ongoing fears associated with natural gas development, particularly here in Western Pennsylvania. And we're going to start with that third one and expand again upon the fears associated with our industry and the fears that you face as a leader in our industry. If for no other reason, then it gives me a chance to explain why I'm standing where I'm standing. And that is at a park about 2,000 feet off the edge of a range resources Marcellus pad. And this park is significant and that pad is significant to me at least because, well, that pad is the closest Marcellus pad to where I live. And this park is one that my family and I make extensive use out of. And in fact, I think uh, all four of my children have participated in some sort of sports here. And in fact, the uh, baseball field I'm standing on is one that I have coached many a t-ball game on. And heck, 20 yards in front of me is a section of the Rachel Carson Trail that I've hiked with my family on many occasions. And right next to that is a stream that my family and I have splashed in and walked through and flipped rocks in and thrown rocks into, again, on many occasions. But what's the point? What's the significance, again, of this location? Well, the point is, when a company like Range Resources comes to an area like this, they need to proactively address the fears of the community. And they did just that several years ago, of course, when they decided to come into this area and drill and ultimately complete the wells that are in close proximity, again, to where I'm standing right now. In fact, again, if my triangulation worked out correctly with the publicly available data, there is a well bore, at least from a bird's eye view, about 300 feet from home plate where I'm standing, albeit it's also about uh, six or 7,000 feet below, so it's not really 300 feet away. But again, I digress. What's the point today? Well, it's not to get into the details of the particular operations of range. It's to talk about how the way in which companies like Range have responded to the fears of communities over the last 20 years since Range fracked that Wren's number one well in Washington County, kicking off the Marcellus boom, the way in which those companies respond should inspire you as a leader to respond to the fears of your stakeholders that you have to deal with on a daily basis. Because while Range, and again, Range's peer companies will hold town halls and obviously attend township meetings and address the individual concerns of neighbors when it comes to traffic or noise or light or whatever, you are likely missing opportunities to do the same thing when it comes to your employees or your colleagues or your bosses. You're likely missing opportunities to proactively share information that you know they're going to want eventually. So instead of waiting for them to come to you and then defensively having to respond, What are the things that you can do? What are the things that you can share to boost transparency? And now transparency, again, is one of those many buzzwords that are thrown around that, again, I'm not so sure your average leader actually deploys. So let me ask you this. Why not take a page from CNX Resources, again, a peer company of range resources? Because CNX, about, I don't know, over a year ago, they kicked off this radical transparency campaign where they went above and beyond the the basic requirements that companies have been doing, again, for well over a decade. That, of course, being, you know, filing for permits and putting public information out there that allowed me to, again, calculate how far uh, the well bore is, or at least one of the well bores from home plate, uh, gives me a chance to, again, go pull this frack focus report and see the chemicals that range resources actually pump down whole from their well pad that's 2,000 feet from where I'm standing. Well, CNX resources said, you know what, we're going to go above and beyond that. We're going to put air monitors on some of our locations and we're going to make that information available in real time to anybody. Well, what can you do to mirror that same approach? Because I run into a lot of leaders who know that they have information that would be valuable to share, but they're scared to do it. They feel like they can't share it. Maybe it's seen as secret or proprietary, or maybe their audience won't be able to handle it or or they'll misconstrue it. To which I say, well, what are all the ways to address their fears without sharing proprietary information? What are all the ways to at least acknowledge their fears 
and then point them to certain things that are in the public domain. Again, much like frack focus and all kinds of other information that's out there from an industry standpoint. Even in people's personal lives. Again, when you're talking about children, hey, what fears and concerns do they have? Because certainly there are some topics that, yeah, maybe you don't want to address with your children, but this isn't some black or white thing. It takes a little bit of innovation to say, hey, look, what are all the ways I can address their fears without having to dive into a topic that's maybe a little heavy for a young child? So again, ask yourself, what can you do to channel the stuff that our industry has been doing for two decades to boost transparency, to proactively address the fears of the community? What can you do to proactively address the fears of your community in the workplace? That being said, let's move on to the other topic or one of the other two topics we talked about. And that, of course, is the election, which, again, we're only five days away from Election Day. I think that's uh, most people could agree that's probably a good thing. If for no other reason, then you've been inundated, especially if you live here in western Pennsylvania, with lots of fear based advertising whether it's mailers, whether it's radio advertisements, television advertisements. Again, in this home stretch, we seem to see an increase in fear-based political ads. And why? Well, at its root, again, fear is being used to try to motivate people to take some sort of action, that is, to vote for or against a certain candidate. But the other side of the equation is that this increase in fear-based advertising could be seen by some political commentators as a sign of desperation. And again, regardless of your political leanings and regardless of your assessment of whether fear-based ads are a signal of desperation, the reality is that in the workplace, using fear or overusing fear absolutely can be a sign of desperation. If you're seen as somebody who doesn't have any positive uh, tricks in your, in your toolbox, if you will, I'm mixing analogies and bags of tricks and toolboxes. But regardless, if you don't have anything that's positive, if you don't have anything that's joyful, and if all you can do is basically instill fear in others to try to get them to take some sort of action, again, not action regarding voting, but action regarding maybe completing a project or, or meeting some sort of deadline or going above and beyond for a client, if all you have is fear to motivate people, well, again, it's very easy for people to draw a conclusion that you are desperate. You've, you've got nothing left. And again, whether that's fair or not, you need to ask yourself in what ways you're overusing fear. In what ways are you being seen as desperate and not, again, having something that's positive? And so, again, what do you do with that information? Well, it starts by leaning on the positives. It starts by flipping the message and saying, well, no, look, here's what happens if we meet this deadline. Here's what happens if you go above and beyond in this project. Here's what happens if you, you know, kind of shape up, so to speak. So don't allow this narrative to, you know, come to fruition that all you've got is fear. Because in many cases, there's a good chance that you're not doing it consciously. You might not realize that you're doing it because, hey, there's a time and a place for fear, right? Sometimes lighting a fire under somebody's rear end is the best motivator and the most appropriate motivator. But it's also important to keep in mind that typically that's just a short-term motivator, right? When it comes to the election, you know what? I don't think a lot of people that are putting out those ads really care what happens after November 5th. They just have to get to November 5th, and then that's it. But if you care at all about being a sustainable leader and having perhaps even some sort of legacy, well, then you need to expand your bag of tricks a bit and ask yourself in what ways you might be overusing fear. That being said, let's move on to the third and final tie-in between fears in the, uh, in the news and in the headlines and in current events and the fears that you face and have to navigate on a daily basis. And that is, of course, the fact that today is Halloween. And when it comes to Halloween, one thing that's interesting about fear is that most of the fear associated with Halloween is desired. People are asking for it. Heck, people pay to be scared, right? People pay to go to a haunted house or go on a haunted walk or a haunted hayride. People want to be surprised. And in many cases, people are willing to pay more and more to seek out those thrills. Why? Because, well, we've become desensitized in many ways to fear, whether it's scary movies or whatever. Again, especially this time of year, it's kind of par for the course, which kind of flips things over to you to say, all right, well, in what ways are you having to deal with the desensitization that the people around you have when it comes to fear? 
have people become so used to surprises at every turn that, again, their expectations are such that, you know what, I'm gonna show up today and I wouldn't be surprised if anything happened. Is that really the mindset that you want your people approaching each day with? No, of course not. So the question for you is, well, how do you address that desensitization? And I would argue it starts with the fact that, well, again, most people that you deal with they don't want fear. It's not like on Halloween where people are seeking out fear and paying money. No, the people that you deal with, what do they want? They don't want to be surprised. They want some measure of certainty. And so the question for you is, well, how do you give them some measure of certainty? As we said in that first example, you know, you can't necessarily share everything with everybody. You know, there was a point where, yeah, being radically transparent makes a whole lot of sense, but there's always going to be something proprietary, something that you can't share, something that, again, you know, might be surprising to your audience. I, I get that. But it comes back to this idea of asking yourself, all right, well, what are all the things you can share that can give some measure of certainty? How can you positively and proactively emphasize the things that aren't changing? How can you go ahead and alleviate concerns that aren't warranted so that it doesn't snowball into this just generalized, hey, let's throw everything in there, anything can change at any given time, when that couldn't be further from the truth? Again, it's all under this umbrella of how do you overcome the desensitization that has occurred in your organization? And again, this is from an industry standpoint, you know, this is what we're used to, right? The ups and downs of the industry, the constant fears of layoffs. I get it. But just because it's there doesn't mean you should be using it as a crutch. Just because you're a leader in an industry and perhaps in an organization that has become desensitized to surprises and to fear at every turn, that doesn't mean you can't take steps to overcome that, to decrease fear. You can be that differentiated leader if you start by, again, being inspired by Halloween, if you will, and recognizing that day to day in the office, well, maybe today in the office, but most days, again, people aren't looking to be surprised. So that being said, how do we wrap all this up together? Well, a couple different themes. So, in the three different ones, you could argue that the three different examples that we talked about, the three different inspirations, you know, we started with the energy industry and shining a light proactively. Well, what is that when we do that? Well, it addresses division, right? It addresses what can be a false divide between people who have information and people who don't have information. How do you bridge that gap? How do you not just give them all the data from a radically transparent standpoint, but also help them understand it to proactively address their fears? So again, division. The second thing that we talked about was what? Desperation. How do you avoid becoming desperate or being seen as desperate because of your overuse of fear as a motivator? And the third item we talked about was what? Desensitization. How do you overcome desensitization and how do you avoid allowing yourself or others around you to use it as an excuse to allow this whole idea that, hey, what's next? There's a surprise at every corner. How do you use those three things? So again, Division, desperation, and desensitization. Those are all three, th three things that you can overcome by asking yourself the right questions, the types of questions that we asked here on the Energy Detox. That being said, it's not enough to just overcome those three negatives. Clearly, from a detox standpoint, we wanna focus on the positive. So how do we do that here? Well, today we're gonna wrap up by emphasizing the positive, at least when it comes to something that October is known for, not just for the, uh, again, the anniversary of the Wren's Frack by Range Resources, not just because it's the month of Halloween, not just because it's the last full month before the election. No, let's start with something else. And that is the fact that October is Healthy Lung Month. And it's a reminder of the importance, of course, of having healthy lungs. And in particular, those growing lungs of your children. Because when it comes to natural gas development and members in this community, what's one thing that they're concerned about? Well, again, it's, it's, it's what's in the air, right? What are your children breathing in? And so we're gonna leave today with something positive, something uplifting. And that is the fact that a study was done that showed that up to $1 trillion of health benefits for people in Pennsylvania have been realized over the last 20 years because of natural gas development. In particular, our shift to natural gas from coal when it comes to power generation, and in particular, the reduction in particulate matter, and in particular, in, in, uh, particular the reduction in NOx and SOx, right? Nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides that have increased the health of our lungs here. So again, don't just start by trying to address people's fears and say it's okay, no. Find those opportunities to go above and beyond, to tout the positives, to tout the reduction in respiratory ailments because of an industry like 
natural gas. And so on that positive note, again, thank you as always for tuning into the Energy Detox. I hope you join me for episode 100 next week. And until then, have a safe and happy Halloween.